And good morning. Good morning, saints. Good morning, sinners. Good morning, people who are trying. Hope you're having a good day. I uh, hope you're excited to be here and worship God. I hope you are willing to open your Bibles up. And at this moment, we're going to go into an act of worship where we're spending time in God's Word. So I'm glad you are here today with us. I'm glad you are here today with us online and that you chose to spend this time with God and keeping your focus on Him. We've got some visitors uh, with us today, and I want you to know that we're so thankful. Really, truly thankful that you chose to be here with us today. It is an honor to see you and have you here today. We've got some old friends that are in town visiting with us. Uh, we're glad that you all are in town as well and, and others that we haven't seen uh, for some time. Uh, it's great to be together and to be here with Christians. I do know it's been a good weekend. One falls here and the weather is amazing. I don't know how it is where you are, where you're watching at home, but this weekend in Evansville was really pretty spectacular. So grateful for that and hope you got out and were able to enjoy it. I do know that some of the, the young'uns that are competing in band had some competitions this week. And I understand Castle kind of dominated. So congrats to uh, those of you that are in the band at uh, Castle High. And my own nephew at Estill County Engineers, which is far away in eastern Kentucky, but they also won. So I uh, want to give a shout out to Tucker as well. You better be watching, Tucker. Um, so uh, he's probably at church uh, physically, but nonetheless. Today we're going to continue in our series where we're going through the book of Daniel. And we are being reminded that God is in control. God is in control. And Daniel's a wonderful book for us to open up and see just how much control God has and is. And that how much we need to be reminded of that. Because the challenges of God's people in the book of Daniel, even as Nebuchadnezzar had taken over the Babylonians and he was leading them in and sieges throughout the world and was very successful. And he had defeated the Egyptians and the world power that they were. Uh, and he was coming in and laid siege to Jerusalem. And early in that, he had captured several of the uh, people of Judah and Daniel and his friends were among them. And he had elevated them through various reasons into positions in his court and set them in positions of power. And in the midst of that, you can imagine the turmoil that they were going through and just trying to figure out who are we while we've been captured and, and who are we in living in this land and how do we exist in the midst of pagans and, and so many things that are in conflict with God? How do we exist in that? Well, that's why today we want to remember God's in control. But specifically today in Daniel chapter 3, we want to pay attention that we need to be following with godly convictions. Godly convictions. That's who they were. God's people. And they needed to pursue that with conviction. But sort of at the core of that, I want to start with this. Do you know how much God loves you? They had to be thinking that back then. How much does God love me? How much does God love me? And this is a relevant topic for us today. Do you know how much God loves you in particular? I mean, he really, truly does. God loves you. And you need to know that and be able to say that in your head right now. As we go into the scriptures and we ingest it, and we talk about God and him being in control. At the core of that, you must understand God loves you. That's not an academic idea. That is the nature of God, and that is a relationship that he has with the people of his creation. God loves you. You might be sitting here right now thinking, I, I don't know. I don't know if God could love someone like me. You might be thinking about things that you have done. You might be thinking about the kind of life you've lived. And that may hit you pretty hard, and you may think that you are so low and so caught up in sin and, and darkness and terrible choices and that life's beat you up that God couldn't possibly love you. But the one true God is great, and he will love you in spite of those things. Oh, there may be disappointments, but his yearning is for you to turn and to come back to him, to be united with him that's what god wants i know this i know this is true because he told us in the scriptures 
First John chapter four. In First John chapter four, beginning in verse seven, there's this thing that the Holy Spirit, God, the Holy Spirit, has inspired the apostle John to write in this epistle. And he writes in First John chapter four this defining thing that we need to commit to our memory and to our hearts and not let go of. It's critical when we're talking about following with godly convictions. The fact that God loves us. He says this, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God. And everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. Now, he who does not love does not know God, for God is love. And this, the love of God, was manifested toward us that God sent his only begotten son into the world that we might live through him. And this is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and he sent his son to be the propitiation that is the payment for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. Critical in this passage is the fact that God communicates to us his love for us for you as an individual. And if we're going to begin exploring this idea that we should follow God with godly convictions, we first need to know that God loves us. Do you know how much he loves you? Oh yeah, he's communicated in word, but in actions he sent Jesus, Jesus to come to this earth, to suffer in a way that we cannot imagine, we cannot process. And that he took on our sins so that we could have life. God shows us not just in words, but in actions. And when we look throughout the entirety of scriptures over and over and over again, we can see that God loved mankind and that he yearned for mankind to be with him. And he yearned for mankind to pursue him and to live for him and to follow him with godly convictions. We love him because he first loved us critical. That has to come into play in Daniel chapter 3. People that have been captured, people that have been trapped, people that are in a distant land, they've got new cultures, new languages. And if you remember in chapter 1, Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they had to relearn new languages. They had to learn those new cultures. They had to be trained in the wisdom and the teachings of that new land. And yet, they did not forget God loves us. God's been there for us. We will follow him. That's at the core of going into this. All right. So in Daniel chapter three, verse one, we see this incredible thing take place. King Nebuchadnezzar, the great ruler of Babylon, he starts constructing something. Now I put on there an image, sort of a generic Mesopotamian type sculpture. Um, It's actually a different kind of shape, but just to give you an idea of sort of aesthetically what it might have looked like at that time period, this is a ballpark approximation. But King Nebuchadnezzar made an image of gold whose height was 60 cubits and its width was six cubits. And he set it up in the plain of Dura in the province of Babylon. Now, think about that for just a moment. This guy, King, and we know kings throughout history have built things before. They love it. Uh, And that really isn't a testament to a bit of pride and look what I've done. But this statue in particular was pretty interesting because it was gold. It was covered in gold. But it's 60 cubits tall. That's about 90 feet. That's about 90 feet tall. That's a pretty big statue. That's about the distance between the bases at a baseball game. That is about three school buses. If you take a school bus, turn it up, stack them up, that's about a little bit shorter than three school buses. It is a massive statue, and it's about nine feet wide. And he puts it up and he makes this proclamation. But first, he's going to gather all the officials around him. So he's made this uh, monstrosity, this immaculate thing that could have looked very uh, beautiful. Uh, But when he calls the people together, he's going to have some expectations for them. And King Nebuchadnezzar in verse 2 sent word to gather together the satraps, the administrators, the governors, the counselors, the treasurers, the judges, the magistrates, and all the officials of the provinces to come to the dedication of the image which King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. So the satraps, the administrators, the governors, the counselors, the treasurers, the judges, the magistrates, and the official of all the provinces gathered together for the dedication of the image that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. And they stood before the image that Nebuchadnezzar had set up. Then a herald cried aloud, To you it is commanded, 
O peoples, nations, and languages, that at the time that you hear the sound of the horn, the flute, the harp, the lyre, and the psaltery in symphony with all kinds of music, you shall fall down and worship the gold image that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. And whoever does not fall down and worship shall be cast immediately into the midst of a burning, fiery furnace. Now that must have been quite a sight. So at that time, when all the people heard the sound of the horn, the flute, the lyre, the harp, and symphony with all kinds of music, all the people, the nations, the languages fell down and worshipped the gold image which King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. And you get it. It's the influence of the culture of the time. It's the influence of the powers in charge that would have caused you to look at this image that had been constructed. And I'm sure it took a great deal of effort. And I'm sure it looked pretty magnificent to see 90 foot tall statue of gold. And then your king calls out and he says in this incredible decree to all the officials, the magistrates, the judges, and everyone, all the people in positions of power, and all the people that were supporting them so they could keep those positions of power, that when they heard this magnificent sound of the flute and the harp and the lyre and the horns and the psaltery in symphony and music, and I'm sure that must have been a magnificent sound, this would have been something to overwhelm the senses. And when you see the grand splendor of the Babylonian kingdom. He calls for you to fall down and worship this idol. I get it. I get how people could have easily been swayed into that and the overwhelming bit of emotion just at that. But on top of it, if you are not swayed by that much, let it be known that if you will not participate, we'll then cast you into a fiery furnace where you will be consumed and die. Not much room for choice there at all. And yet while most people did this, there were some people that remembered our God is in control. Our God is in control. And our God loves us and we love him. So our reaction cannot be contrary to the expectations of God, no matter how impressive or magnificent, no matter what officials do, we must pledge our dedication and allegiance to the one true God. And that brings us to Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Now, they clearly had made a choice, and there's officials that are going to snitch on them is what's going to happen, and not much respect for that. But verse 8, therefore, at that time, certain Chaldeans came forward and accused the Jews. They spoke and said to King Nebuchadnezzar, O king, live forever. You, O king, have made a decree that everyone who hears the sound of the horn, the flute, harp, lyre, and psaltery in symphony with all kinds of music, shall fall down and worship the gold image. And whoever does not fall down and worship shall be cast into the midst of a burning, fiery furnace. Here's the snitching part. There are certain Jews whom you have set over the affairs of the province of Babylon, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. These men, O king, have not paid due regard to you. They do not serve your gods or worship the gold image which you have set up. They refuse to do it. Well, Nebuchadnezzar, as we've seen in chapter 2, certainly didn't seem to be a man who would control his temper easily. And sure enough, in rage and fury in verse 13, he gave the command to bring Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. So they brought these men before the king. Nebuchadnezzar spoke, saying to them, Is it true, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you do not serve my gods or worship the gold image which I've set up? Now, if you are ready at the time you hear the sound of the horn, the flute, the harp, the lyre, and psaltery, and symphony with all kinds of music, and you fall down and worship the image which I have made, good. That's good. But if you do not worship, you shall be cast immediately into the midst of a burning, fiery furnace. And who is the God who will deliver you from my hands? Who is the God that will deliver you? Now, at this point, you can clearly see that Nebuchadnezzar is certainly caught up in the grandeur and the splendor and the, all the officials that have agreed to follow him and all the people that have agreed to follow him and the magnificence of the idol that he had built and the magnificence of the song that's being played. Everyone should, should follow suit. And if not, you will surely be burned up. What could you possibly, what reason could you possibly have to not, not follow what everyone else is doing? 
The government's ordered it. The culture has followed it. All the important people are giving way to it as well. In fact, if you don't follow, your own life is at risk. But again, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they know God is in control. In this strange land, in this foreign culture, with these pagan beliefs that are leading them astray from God, they know God is in control. And they know that God loves them. So they reply in kind. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to answer you in this matter. If that is the case, that they would be put to death in a fiery furnace, if that is the case, our God, our God, whom we serve, is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace. And he will deliver us from your hand, O king. But if not, let it be known to you, O king, we do not serve your gods, nor will we worship the gold image which you have set up. I don't think they had a disrespectful tone. I don't know. It doesn't tell us tone. We don't have a recording of it. We don't have a movie of it. We don't know. But they did answer firmly, didn't they? They did answer with the conviction of people who truly love their God. They did answer in a way that shows, yeah, I get it. I see your statue and I see your officials. I see the power of your nation and I see the, the glory and the wealth that you have. I see all of that. I hear the, the sounds that you make with your horns, your flutes, your harps, your psaltery and the symphony, the music. I hear all that. But that's not God. And first and foremost, if we're God's people, we're going to follow God first. And God's law will take preeminence always and every single time. So, if we are to be cast in a fiery furnace, so be it. I'd imagine they were a little uncomfortable with the idea of being burned alive. But they were driven more by the conviction that their God is in control. They were driven more by the understanding that God loves them and He's always going to love them, whether in Babylon or in Judah. Whether it was in the 6th century B.C. and even for us today in the 21st century, God loves His people. It's a fact. But mankind has found ways to always challenge God and His authority and His power and our tendency to cloud up the idea that God loves us. And on this, we must be very, very careful, like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Even if we understand the Babylonian gods and they had a whole slew of a pantheon of their own, and even the Egyptians, some of those we might be more familiar with, I bet we know a lot more of the Greek and Roman gods as well. Not much difference, really. But it's a human thing where humans tend to elevate themselves to take preeminence, challenge God in a lot of ways. And the Greek and Roman gods, and you may have your favorite stories of Zeus or Jupiter, take your pick of which, which flavor you want, Hermes and the others, Persephone and Sisyphus and all those great stories. They're wonderful stories. But our understanding of those gods, it seems to realize that they take an idea of a god and they idealize them. That's even portrayed in their statues. They're these idealized, perfect forms of what a human should look like. But then they take a quality that is human and then they elevate that and they make it godlike level to a level that humans will not be able to attain. That's a god for them. But even the relationship they have with those gods, imagined or not, would be one in which there's a sense of control. It's not a relationship where the gods love them and care for them, quite different than the God of the Bible, but it's one in which they carry on with a certain degree of words, rituals, sacrifices, in order to conduct almost a transactional relationship. If I conduct these words, and if I give you these sacrifices, will that satisfy you enough to act on our behalf? And if so, those rituals they would use to go out into war or they would use to um, grow their crops or they would use them to go about their daily lives. But it was a man-made thing, something that comes from within man to create and make sense of the world that some would use to set God aside and follow a man construct. It changed over the centuries for sure. And we get to this one period that really affected our modern age and the age of enlightenment. The long 18th century, as some would say. And at the core of that, at the beginning, you would have guys late 17th century, like uh, Sir Isaac Newton, of which you get this statue, this particular one, showing a little bit different style, but it's a different idea in this time period. Hume and Hobbes, Locke, 
early on as well, would influence the idea that we should move our sciences away from superstitious uh, ideas and customs and traditions should be challenged, both on a political level and on a social level. Really, Britain, it started to shift, but in France and other countries, it really led to some upheaval. But what mankind could do by observation and what mankind could do by experiment really started shifting the way that we viewed ourselves in our world. Now, religiously, there was a time of great turmoil in this as well as the Reformation was deeply underway and some of it was coming to a conclusion and moving into the Restoration period uh, as well. But you get the idea of individualism, of progress, taking the preeminence sometimes over God himself. And some of the great philosophers during those time periods would even set God aside and minimize him. And some would even proclaim a great hope that there would be a time which there would be no Bibles to be found and that man would live by empirical observation, uh, experimentation. All right. There's some good things that came out of that as well. But that shifted and grew over time until we moved into a postmodern time frame as well. Another emphasis on mankind. With the Age of Enlightenment, the shift in philosophy and political discourse and whatnot generally changed from God-centered to man-centered. And it elevated in a postmodern time frame in which now man-centered has become the dominant force. The idea to destabilize Inherent truths became, well, became the goal, the idea, politically, socially, religiously, that there were no single absolute truths. There was nothing we could all agree on as singularly true, but context would dictate that. In fact, your subjective understanding, this would be the peak of it, it's your subjective understanding of truth in a context at a moment would be sufficient to define truth. A different kind of statue represents that, for sure. These are all efforts to subvert God in some ways. These are all things that men have done over time that challenge the way that we follow our convictions and follow our God, the one true God. We'll come back to that in just a second, but we need that established. We'll go back to the fact that no matter what the situation, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego said, we will serve no other God even if it costs us our life. Even if it costs us our lives. And so a fiery furnace was prepared. I don't have a good picture of a fiery furnace, so I thought lava filled. That's pretty hot. So lava filled is out there and it's boiling over. Probably didn't look like this at all. And they know that's going to happen. So then Nebuchadnezzar calls in various servants and he's so infuriated and angered that they would not even change that he decides to make it even hotter. And so he boils the flames up and, and, and stokes the fire. And as it's so hot and it's so intense that the men that were close to it were caught on fire and they burned and died themselves. Those men that were supposed to cast them in, they caught fire. The intensity of the flames uh, was very, very strong. And then these three men, verse 23, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they fell down, bound into the midst of the burning, fiery furnace. They stood by their convictions, even into the fire. God loves them. Then King Nebuchadnezzar was astonished, and he rose in haste, and he spoke, saying to his counselors, Did we not cast three men bound in the midst of the fire? And they said to him, True, O king. And he said, Look, I see four men, four men loose, walking in the midst of the fire, and they are not hurt. And the form of the fourth is like the Son of God. God chose to protect them. God chose at that moment to protect them from the fires, to have them uh, come forth out of it. And the result of that was another step forward for Nebuchadnezzar. He went near the mouth of the burning fiery furnace and spoke saying, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, servants of the Most High God, come out and come here. Then Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came from the midst of the fire. And the satraps, administrators, governors, and the king's counselors gathered together. And they saw these men on whose bodies the fire had no power. The hair of their heads was not singed, nor were the garments affected, and the smell of the fire was on them. And Nebuchadnezzar spoke, saying, Blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who sent his angel and delivered his servants, who trusted in him 
And they have frustrated the king's word and yielded their bodies that they should not serve nor worship any god except their own God. Now, you remember in chapter 2 that Nebuchadnezzar, after having the dream explained to him by Daniel, made a similar decree about sacrifices given to the one true God. It seems like this is a work in progress for him, but it's another step closer. God protected those men in that strange foreign country, in that culture, under that rulership, who were being attacked by the culture around them and the king's orders. He protected them so that they could help people see there is one true God. And his power is the preeminent power. And his law is not to be subverted by any man-made construct or law. He stood firm. What a comfort. Our God is in control. What a comfort. Our God loves his people. But it begs the question for us today, what would cause you to walk into the fiery furnace? What would cause you to walk in the fiery furnace? It now becomes a very personal question, doesn't it? Because it's easy. It's easy for us to sit and read this story and say, yeah, I'd do that. Of course I'd do that. I mean, you know. 2,600 years ago, if I was in that situation, I'd get up in Nebuchadnezzar's face and I'd let him know. But you don't know. Most of us haven't been challenged and tested in that way at all. Most of us really haven't had our lives put to the test because of our faith. Some have. We live in a world that does give us challenges, though, don't we? We live in a world that wants to subvert the rule and authority of God and it beats on our faith. Sometimes we get up in the morning, we look around and we say, yeah, I, I know I'm in a strange land, but it's not a strange land because God is in control. We get up in the morning sometimes, we turn on the news and we open the paper and we look at those words and the stories and the narratives and we say to ourselves, these stories seem so foreign to me. It's like a different kind of culture, a different kind of people. But yet, while that may beat on our faith a little bit, God is in control and God loves. And we hear these ideas and these new policies and these political and social commentaries that are made and they challenge God's law and his rule. And, and sometimes we bump up against it. It's the fiery furnace situation. Will we walk through it and stand by our convictions and our commitment to God? In this world today, there is violence that's being done towards Christians unjustifiable violence is being done to other people. That's not under the rule of God. Not at all. In fact, in this world today, it's almost been normalized to expect that innocent unborn babies may be easily cast aside. That's not under the law of God. In this world today, the very institution of marriage, the way that God created it, is being challenged and subverted in so many ways. And I know the temptation at this point is like, yep, he's about to talk about the homosexuals. Sure, but not just the homosexuals either. What about the people that try to redefine what marriage is even supposed to be about? God says one man, one woman for life, for life. And now people say, let us live together without that commitment. And let us commit adultery with no shame and no regard for God's law in that. Let us subvert God's expectations for marriage. It beats against us. What about identity? God gave a certain role for the man and a role for the woman. God gave us an identity. God gave us an identity as his people. But the world today tries to subvert that with not one, not two, but I think there's 60-something different genders you can choose from on Facebook. I haven't checked. I'm pretty happy with two. Let's not complicate things. But these are things that we butt up against. And sometimes it butts up against us and says, listen, culture is really big. And listen, government's really impressive. And listen, there's a lot of wealth and power and influence. And the music sounds good and the entertainment sounds good. Bow down to these ideas contrary to God. Do it simply and you'll walk easily in this life. But the followers of God who walk with convictions will say, wait a minute. God's given me a brain. God's given me a heart. God's given me his word. Let me choose what God says. I can make that choice. God's people can make that choice. And God's people must make that choice. 
There's challenges that come in the world today. Sometimes when we look at the God that we, we read about in the Bible and we minimize him, we chase after a minimal God, one that's not too different than man, one that's maybe just a slight extension for us, one where we minimize his control and authority over the world because we don't want to confront it or think about it, and we certainly don't want to submit ourselves to it. One where we make God small and incapable of moving in a world because we close our lives off to him. And we think somehow, maybe we can control God. It's too small a God. It won't do. It will not do. And if we follow that kind of God and we pursue that kind of God, and even though it's a weird, perverse view of the one true God, it's not going to let you follow with convictions. You'll fall apart in your faith. Learn the one true God. But what about the idol of the unread God? You know, one of the greatest challenges to the, the church today, really, I gave a whole list of things and there's more that certainly butt up against church and truth for sure. But one of the greatest challenges to the church is biblical literacy. It is true that many, many people that call themselves Christians, we'll use that general sense of it, show great honor and respect for the scriptures. They really do. But very few know their scriptures, and still fewer follow those scriptures, which means it is imperative that those of us that decide to be Christians and commit to God must know our Bible and not just kind of know it, sort of think maybe that's in there somewhere, but know the Bible. I was reading an article and it talked about this uh People, I'm not going to make fun of anybody. Don't take this as making fun of it, but it's worrisome. And they thought Sodom and Gomorrah was a married couple in the Bible. Sodom and Gomorrah was a married couple in the Bible. They didn't know who Noah was. They didn't know who Moses was. That's worrisome. Not mocking those people. No interest in that. Because if that's where you are and you're willing to study the Bible and learn it, I say great. I commend you for wanting to dive in there and learn it. You don't have to know all the details yet, but your willingness to go in there and understanding God as he revealed himself, incredibly important. The fact that God took the time to give us something so powerful as his word so that we could know exactly who he is and not be impressed with the magnificence of a government or a statue or uh, the, the influential people of the world or the entertainers and the sounds they make but to see true awe and respect and magnificence in God and God alone above all things, we have to know that God, not just a vague sense of him, but as he revealed himself. Question, ask questions, pursue that curiosity in scriptures. It's okay to have discourse and talk about it and try to figure it out. It's what we've been doing in the, uh, the worship services the last 15 uh, weeks during our discussion groups. Those are healthy things. We need to make sure that we are participating in a church that encourages biblical literacy, but we are participating in a way to enhance it as well. We've got to make that happen. Thirdly, the challenge is the idols that come bashing up against us of unreal and subjective gods. Pretty big deal today. I put the statue up. I don't know if any of you have ever seen this. Some of you might have seen it in person. It's about Jeff Koons one of the most popular and profound artists living today. If you want to buy Jeff Koons' statue, you better have at least $30 million. I don't know why we don't have two in the front of the church building. Because <laughs> people will throw eggs at them, that's why. <laughs> and it's $30 million. This is true postmodern art. It's supposed to look like it's inflated, like a large balloon. It's supposed to be a ballerina which would be this very elegant and beautiful thing. And it draws our mind back to those artists like Degas and, and the way that they carried on ballerinas and the movement itself. But this is a different take on that. The reality and power of this only exist in the context in the midst of these buildings and the business and the, the civilized world. And he's taken sort of a kitsch idea and he's made it grandiose and shiny. Because humans are impressed with grandiose and shiny, not unlike the 90-foot gold statue all the way back in the 6th century B.C. in Babylon. But if we make it big enough and shiny enough, and if we assign enough value to it, we are subverting old ideas and customs, 
And this carries a different kind of power. But if you isolate it from all of that on its own, it loses all of that. It, it falls apart. It's meaningless. It's just a big hunk of steel and a neat composition. And if you're not in on the joke, you kind of shrug your shoulders anyway, which is probably why we're not going to put it in front of the building. But there's an elders meeting next week, so maybe it's <laughs> not going to happen. That's the God that most people follow today. The one with no real meaning. No real meaning. It's puffed up. Sometimes it's grandiose. Sometimes it's shiny. Sometimes the, the preacher speaking of them will wear the right kind of smile and say the right words and they'll, they'll show off in a particular kind of way. It's the wrong God. These challenge our convictions as well because it's almost like it's, we got to be in on the joke and the joke is about God and there's no real commitment or conviction in the religion. The faith is empty. Just as empty as the inside and purpose of that statue. We need a one true God. We need to know our God and we need to follow one. And we need to commit to Him. Our world has its own challenges where so many things of mankind puff themselves up, build themselves up, and want you to challenge who God said He is and who God said you, you are supposed to be. Created in His image, following His Word, driving through life even with its obstacles, you press on through it, through the fiery furnaces, knowing He loves you, He cares about you, He gives you a home in heaven and purpose and meaning in life today. We started off talking about, do you know God loves you? I hope you do. But more than just knowing God loves you, I hope you're acting. Acting and responding to God loving you by first loving Him but also loving the world around you and doing that with conviction where you will not bend, you will not fold, you will commit fully even until your last breath. Our scripture reading we opened with, we're going to close with, whoever believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. And everyone who loves him, who begot, also loves him who is begotten of him. By this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and keep his commandments. For this is the love of God that we keep His commandments. And His commandments are not burdensome. For whatever is born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. Who is He who overcomes the world? But He who believes that Jesus is the Son of God. My friends, saints, sinners, you can overcome the world. It does not matter what government exists at the time. God is in control. It doesn't matter what shiny statues exist that they call us to fall down and worship. God is in control. It doesn't matter what songs they make. It doesn't matter what cultural things they say and do. It's not as impressive as our God. It's not as true as our God. Worship God, follow God, and do it with passion and conviction. That's what the world needs to see. Because when they see that, there are some who will respond just like when Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came out of the fire. They say there is one true God. He is the most high God. Let us change our lives and follow him. That's a choice humans can make. But when they see us living in that truth with conviction, we're helping them make that choice in the right direction, pointing towards God. Today, if there's a way that we can help you, if there's a way that you want to know God, if there's a way that you feel so distant from God, maybe you are a person sitting right now who does feel God doesn't love you or care about you, if there's a way we can help you understand that, if you want to spend time in the Scriptures, come let us know. If there's a way that you want to give your life in to Jesus because you want to repent of turning away from Him long ago, let us do something about it. If you want to learn what it means to be a Christian and how to become one, if you want to learn what faith is and what repentance is, what commitment is, confession and baptism and faithful living, let's do something about it. There's too much out there that's trying to push you away from God. This is a place, these are people that want to pull you closer to God. If there's a way that we can help you, come forward as we stand and as we sing.